Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 10th, 2009. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Chris Colby, editor of Brew Your Own Magazine, joins us to talk about some partial mash recipes that are a little out of the ordinary. Extract brewers can take a step off the beaten path by stepping up into partial mashing. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter, my username, Basic Brewing, all one word. Also, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing video page on Facebook. Uh, on Facebook, And if you become a fan of the show there, I'll be sending out occasional notices when shows are posted and such. I've only read that about a thousand times. Well, maybe not a thousand. Uh, thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra and you'll be helping us to bring you the show, and we appreciate your support. And uh, we also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site, too. All go to help us bring you good stuff. My uh, contribution to the BYO-BBR collaborative experiment on yeast pitching rates is in the bottle. I bottled this past Friday, and I'm looking forward to tasting it in a few weeks. The deadline for submitting your data, if you're participating in the experiment, is September 30th. And yes, I finally put up the online form for you to report your data. You can find it at basicbrewing.com slash experiment. Uh, You can also find a link uh, to Chris's blog entry with the details on participating and a PDF with the information and a worksheet that you can use to collect your notes on the process. Very exciting stuff. Once again, basicbrewing.com slash experiment or at the top of the page at uh, basicbrewingradio.com. This is going to be a short intro uh, into the interview this week because I'm getting ready to head out to the northwest part of the country with my buddy Andy Sparks, owner of thehomebrewery.com and uh, the man responsible for my getting into home brewing. Andy and I are heading up to uh, attend Hop Madness which is a gathering at Willamette Mission State Park, not too far from Portland. You can find out more at hopmadness.com. I've heard from a a few of you who say that you're going to be up there too. I'm looking forward to seeing you. That's where we'll be be seeing the hop harvesting process, and we'll be hanging out with home brewers who are camping and brewing in the park. Can't wait for that. That happens on Saturday. But uh, before then, Andy and I are going to fly in on th- uh, Thursday afternoon. I'm recording this a, a day early, as usual. So we'll be flying in Thursday evening and uh, doing some fun stuff at that time. And then uh, we've got other uh, – we're lining up uh, at least one brewery tour for your video and audio listening uh, pleasures. Uh, so th- who knows – what we'll do or who we'll run into up there. So stay tuned for that next week. So anyway, wish us luck. We hope to see you there. And uh, you can check our our Twitter accounts. Uh, Andy is uh, Brew Lager Beard on Twitter if you want to follow him as well. Uh, okay. A while back we talked to uh, Chris Colby about his technique of using a two-gallon cooler to do partial mashes on the countertop. Well, he's back to talk about using that method to make some beers that are a bit unusual. Well, Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me on, James. We're going to talk about uh, partial mashing, but before we go into that, let's bring everybody up to speed on where we are on our uh, Brew Your Own Magazine, Basic Brewing Radio collaborative experiment it is underway is it not it's on yep (laughs) (laughs) like a gang fight it's on yeah it's on 
But it's but it's like one of those gang fights in West Side Story. It's more about dancing than fighting, actually, right? The, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you're going to draw a parallel. <laughs> With the bubbling fermentation locks and all that, yeah. <laughs> so we're testing, uh, as I probably will have said in the introduction to this interview, we're testing uh, how yeast pitching rates affect beer. Uh, fermentation, homebrew fermentation, and you had a little bit of a uh, of a um, false start on yours. Yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I've been a home brewer for a while. I know what you can and can't get away with, but every once in a while, I sort of persist in trying to get away with something. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I had a, uh, I was going to brew this batch uh, the day that it was on my wife's birthday. She was, you know, she was still going into work, but we were going to go head out and have some beers with our homebrew club later. And um, I didn't get started exactly as early as I wanted to because, you know, the video game Civilization Four is very entertaining. <laughs> and, uh, and so anyway, I got started a little bit later than I wanted. And, you know, my idea was that I was going to brew the beer while she was away, cool it down, uh, you know, so it was nice and, nice and cool, and then just let it settle while we were out having a couple beers. Then I'd come back in the evening, you know, and, and, and rack it to, to Carboys. Of course, that that didn't work out <laughs> exactly how. It, um, you know, for one thing, when it gets up to nearly a hundred every day, you know, and down for recently from being over a hundred every day, you are, uh, you know, our tap water is like at seventy five or eighty degrees. Mm-hmm. So I was having difficulties getting the temperature down, and by the time my wife was like, you know, let's go, uh, the the work really wasn't that cool by any, uh, you know, it wasn't burning hot anymore, but it was was warmer than it should be. And then, you know, we stayed out later than, than we expected. And, you know, when I got back, uh, I just wasn't in the mood for, you know, two hours of racking and, and all that. Cause with, you know, five carboys and weighing out all the yeast and all that, there's, uh, it's a little more of a production than just racking it into one carboy. So I said, I'll just wake up early and do it the next morning. So I did it and, um, I saved my wort. Uh, or I saved a little bit of wort on the side just as a as a wort stability test, and you know, sure enough, as as I would have predicted, uh, although I was, was hoping against uh, the wort, like started spontaneously fermenting the next day, and the uh, the carboys of you know actual pitched beer uh, just smelled awful, so uh, I had to take the next weekend and brew again. So your experiment with no chill brewing didn't work out so well. Yeah, my experiment with no chill brewing uh, was, is a thumbs down. Um, I mean, granted, I didn't have the. They usually do. They have some way of sealing the wort up, mm-hmm. uh, and I just had the uh, the lid on the uh, lid on the the brew pot. And I mean, there was there was some uh, other stuff over over the lid to try to keep stuff out. But oh yeah, well, was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, so. You- so I relearn that lesson every you know every couple of years. <laughs> so you uh, you have uh, done a restart, and you're you're going beyond our basic instructions, which is pitch the recommended amount of yeast and then pitch uh, under and then pitch over. You've mm-hmm. got five different batches going. Right, I got uh, five three gallon carboys. There's two gallons of wort in each, and I pitched uh, one, two. Four, eight, and sixteen grams of yeast, respectively. Uh, the middle, the middle one of those, the four grams, is uh, pretty much right on line with uh, the recommended pitching rate. And um, the one above and below that are half as much and twice as much. And the two on the ends are uh, a quarter as much yeast and four times as much yeast. Wow! So I've got the uh, the spectrum pretty much covered. And my. My little uh, barley wine. I'm calling it a barley wine. It started at 10.79, so I guess you could call that a barley wine. Uh, it is in the bottle, so oh. I'm just just waiting for that to to uh, bottle condition, and then uh, you know we can we can taste that. I did. Uh, the recommended rate was it was these are two gallon batches. I split uh, one six gallon batch into three. And the recommended pitching rate was six grams of dry yeast, so I used six grams. And then my gram scale, or my scale, only measured in whole grams, so I went with two grams, which is a third, and mm-hmm. twenty-four grams, which is four times the recommended pitching rate. So, uh, 
I I told everybody on the on the previous podcasts that uh, I knew what the finishing gravity w- was, but I'm I'm not going to tell. I don't want I don't want to influence anybody out there uh, who's in the middle of doing the experiment. And I have heard from people who are doing the experiment, including uh, Mark Smith up in uh, uh, Benton County, Arkansas. Uh, you've heard on the show he's doing a pilsner. Mm, good. So it'll be interesting to do uh, a lager. So anyway, we've we've got that on tap. I hope everybody is is uh, taking part of that, or or several people are taking part in that. Uh, you can find out all the details on Chris's blog at byo.com slash blogs. And you can see the uh, the experiment, the online experiment form, as well as download a detailed uh, proce- procedure PDF along, <clears throat> along with uh, a worksheet at uh, basicbrewing.com slash experiment. And there's a link to that also on the Basic Brewing Radio page. So there you go. Exciting stuff. I can't wait. Um, but on to the meat of the discussion. We had talked in the past about your countertop uh, partial mashing technique where you use a, a, a two-gallon cooler to uh, uh, work with uh, partial mashing, which is very cool. Uh, and when I first heard that you were you were doing an article on partial mashing, I thought, well, we've done that before. But then I looked, and you've got some really interesting recipes to use with the technique. So I thought, well, it'd be fun to revisit the topic and then explore how you can use this uh, uh, technique to really do some interesting stuff. So first of all, walk us through. Uh, we have to remember that we've got newbies listening, so we have to kind of quickly uh, start from the ground level and bring them up to speed before we move on. Uh, so what is partial mashing to begin with? Partial mashing is just a way to, to make a beer where you um, – it's sort of a hybrid between all grain brewing and, uh, and brewing with extracts, malt extracts. Uh, what you do is you you mash a small amount of grain, uh, and, and the amount you know varies depending on what. There, there's many different methods of, of making a partial mash, but you you mash some of the grain and you make some of your wort that way, uh, and then you you know you boil it at hops like as usual. But you use malt extract then to bring the uh, you know your expected gravity, uh, specific gravity up to the actual you know, your, your target value. Um, in, for example, in countertop partial mashing, you know, usually somewhere for most average strengths of beers, usually somewhere between a third and a half of the, uh, the extract weight of the beer, you know, the total amount of stuff, uh, uh, that contributes to a specific gravity. Um, about half of that comes from, uh, the mash and then the remaining, you know, half to two thirds, it comes from malt extract. So it is a way that you can uh, kind of, number one, ease your way into all-grain brewing and then also uh, a way to add some complexity to uh, just plain extract brewing that you you couldn't just by using extracts. Right. If you're an extract brewer, uh, partial mash brewing does several things. As you mentioned, it it kind of demystifies the idea of mashing uh, and all-grain brewing. A lot of times the instructions for all-grain brewing – Sort of because there is a scientific component, some people can't seem to stop themselves from talking about enzymes and, and you know making it seem really complicated. But in reality, all grain brewing boils down to you take crushed malt and you steep it in hot water. Mm-hmm. So it's um, and and doing a partial mash is a great way to just do it at a small scale. You don't feel like you know if, if you mess it up, well you know it's just on a small scale and it's not uh, you know it's not a big deal. Uh, so one thing partial mashing does is, yeah, for extract brewers, takes the mystery out of uh, all grain brewing and gives them, you know, maybe if if they're interested in, in it, the, the re- you know reason to proceed that way. It also gives extract brewers uh, the ability to use a lot of different malts that they normally wouldn't be able to because they they need to be mashed and you know usually mashed in in, a, in some sort of quantity. You know, like uh, you can you can mash or, or you can sort of steep small amounts of Vienna or Munich. Uh, in your beer, but really to get any character from them, you would need a you know a decent amount, and and for that you really need to step up to a partial mash. And you know there are other uh, specialty malts like uh, Rauch malts, which is the uh, German smoked malt, and 
Um, you know, just also different base malts that, uh, you know, you can get, you know, pale malt extract or light malt extract, and it gives you, you know, uh, a extract made from, you know, some kind of light malt. But if you, if you want to control what kind of light malt you're using, you can experiment, you know, with using, uh, say, British floor malted Maris Otter. You know, you can use uh, the Scottish Golden Promise. You can use, you know, specifically a German Pilsner malt. You can use specifically an American uh, domestic two-row or, or six-row. Or, you know, it gives you the freedom to use, uh, incorporate basically any different uh, base malt into your uh, into your brewing that you, uh, you know, you can't to any, to any great degree with just plain extract brewing. And these are, you know, these base malts have starches that need to be converted by a mash. You can't just steep them in the in the water as you're, you know, bringing the water up to temperature as you would just a specialty grain like crystal or chocolate malt or something like that as you normally would with uh, an extract with grains recipe. So if you wanted to experiment with these uh, sort of more exotic base malts, uh, you you can't just steep it in a grain bag. You do have to go through the mashing process, and and your method of of using the the, the cooler is a really cool way of of doing it, uh, pretty in in a fairly easy way. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, the uh, uh, the way I formulated or the basic idea behind like the countertop partial mash was there's you know there's a lot of different methods and most of them you know involve you've got all your your grains, you've got them in a big grain bag, and you know some some methods you heat it all on your stove and then you lift out the grain bag and put it in a colander and and sort of rinse it and that's uh, you know that works, but it's it's kind of it, it's splashy you know um, I've done it a few times that way and, and you end up splashing quite a bit if you're not really careful. There's also you know oven mashing where you uh, you know put uh, Again, you put it in the grain bag and you put it in a in a pot and like stick it in the oven, you know, on, on low as possible with the door open. And um, I don't know, living in Texas, like having the oven on and the door open isn't always something that I look forward to. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you know, if I want just raging hot temperatures, I'll go outside. Um, and, and also, then you know, you got to reach in and and the, the the pot's hot, and you know, not not that pot holders are unavailable technology but you know <laughs> you know it just it gives you you're reaching into the oven and and, and having to move that and then you, you know you still have to pull the grain bag out and do all that and you know it, it's not undoable plenty of people do it uh but the keeping the grain bag contained in the cooler and just pouring hot water on top and then running off uh, wort through the, the spigot is just a nice uh clean way of doing it it's uh you know, it, there's, it makes very little mess, and it also it's a lot more similar to all grain brewing in that you don't, um, you know, once the the mash has been started, you you know, it, it the grain bed basically stays there. You don't ever, you know, yank uh, like the whole grain bed and move it to another uh, container. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And also, just one quick comment on steeping. Um, the difference between steeping and, and mashing is they're both, you know, soaking crushed grains in water. Mm-hmm. That you know, the the big differences are temperature. In, in mashing, your, your temperature has to be in, uh, you know, within the range. It's usually 148 to 162, and, and in practice, it's usually a lot narrower than that. Um, but it has to be somewhere in that range. And also, the, the mash volume has to be uh, within a certain range. You know, you could... Uh, you could steep, you know, grains and have them mash if the, if your temperature and mash volume were, were right. Mm. Um, but most people, when they steep when they steep grains, they've got you know two and a half or three gallons of water in their brew pot and they're steeping like a pound of you know grains in it. And that's really um, you're not going to fully mash the grains at that point. You'll get you know if you have, if you're at the right temperature, you'll get some conversion because you know they'll be uh, starch will let out into the uh, the word, and the, the enzymes will run into some of it, but it's just too dilute. And, and the nice thing about partial mashing is, you know, not only do you you make sure that you convert all the 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 starch that you have in there, you know, you use it at, at a much at, at a higher 
uh, you know rate per five gallons than you would with steeping. Hmm. Now let, the you've got let's see one two uh, three what three three recipes three recipes isn't it uh, yeah we've got a sweet potato ESB mm-hmm. our, a barbecue brow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a compromise bock. And these are recipes that, uh, you know, with just a partial mash, you can experiment with some interesting techniques. Let's start out with a sweet potato ESB. This is a beer that you couldn't do with just uh, an extract uh, batch, right? Right. In this in this partial mash sort of uh, roundup, you know, this, this recipe collection I wanted to focus on... Uh, on beers where you, you know, use the technique of mashing in, in an unusual way and, and, you know, adapt that for, for partial mashing. And the first one is just an, ad, an adaptation of my uh, sweet potato beer that I've brewed uh, a number of times. And it's basically just a uh, strong English ale. Uh, I call it an ESB. Um, you know, uh, it's got uh, base malt, uh, you know, British pale malt, some crystal malt, and then uh, there's some sweet potatoes thrown in. You you boil the sweet potatoes, you know, cube them up and, and and make them into sort of mashed potatoes, and then stir that into your mash. And all this does really is there are, uh, the starches from the potatoes get used just like you know the starches if it had been barley, and it gives you know adds some extract weight to the to the beer, and it also adds uh, an interesting kind of color, especially mm. in combination with a darker crystal. There's no there's no sweet potato flavor to the beer. Um, you could try roasting the sweet potatoes if, if that's what you were looking for. Like if you're trying to make a, a Thanksgiving beer and you really wanted like a, a sweet potato flavor to it. But uh, in the recipe as it is in there is just um, the, the sweet potatoes just add extract weight and a little bit of color, and it basically it ends up tasting like a pale ale, but it has has an interesting color, and uh, there's you know there's an interesting story <laughs> to go with it if you you know <laughs> give it to your friends, you, you know you made made use sweet potatoes in making it. So the uh, the, the enzymes that are in the base malt uh, at mashing temperature work to convert the starches in the potato into sugars. Right, the starch. Uh, in sweet potatoes uh, has a uh, gelation temperature that that's l- lower than the mash. So um, and also you you boil them before. So even if it didn't, it's fine. But mm-hmm. you know you you boil the potatoes, um, work them into the mash, and the starches from the potatoes will uh, you know diffuse throughout the mash. And then yeah, you're right. The uh, the enzymes from the the malted grains will. Uh, just go take care of those the starches, you know, degrade them into maltose and maltotriose and uh, larger strains, larger, you know, uh, chain, quote-unquote, dextrins, uh, just like they would starch from barley. Now, do you have to <clears throat> do you have to worry about uh, a stuck sparge at all or a stuck mash? I mean, you don't mention anything about using rice hulls or anything like that. Is there just the ratio of sweet potato to... Um, uh, to grain such that you don't have to worry about that? Right. This is a, in the partial mash uh, recipe, I use sweet potatoes at a rate that's actually lower than the rate that I used it on my all-grain brews that yeah. I've done of it. Hmm. So there's no... Uh, and I found that if you if you take the sparge, you know, at a nice reasonable uh, rate, you know, you don't even have to slow it down, really. But just at, at, the, at a reasonable rate, uh, you, you should have no problem, absolutely, hmm. at, at that range. I found with uh, with regular potatoes that uh, there's definitely a threshold over which your uh, your you know mash goes from a mash with potatoes in it to like a, a cement block that's just <laughs> impenetrable. <laughs> and you and the cooking of the potatoes is a necessary uh, step. You couldn't just cube up raw potatoes and put them in there. Um, if you if you just cubed them and put them in there, you would. Uh, I mean, the cubes would be thick enough, and they wouldn't have enough time, really, for all the starches to get out. Mm. You know, the, the temperature of the mash should be enough to, you know, the temperature's over the, the gelation temperature for the starches. But, you know, you, you pretty much need to boil them to get, you know, uh, get the, you know, get the starches just readily available so that you can stir that, the you know, sweet potato mush, essentially, into the, uh, 
into the mash. So, so I have a question. You've got uh, uh, two kinds of, of base malt, a British pale malt, a two mm-hmm. row, uh, and then you have crystal malt, sweet potatoes. Yeah. Then you have um, Munton's light dry malt extract and then Munton's light liquid malt extract. Why would you – would you have to use both the dry and the liquid or could you just go with one or the other? You could use either either form. Um, in BYO recipes, we just sort of as a uh, – I don't know, just as, a, as an arbitrary thing that we do is we call for liquid malt extract for late uh, additions. You know, when, you, uh, when you're when you making an, an extract beer or a partial mesh beer and you're adding extract late in the boil, we always specify those are liquid additions. Um, mm. one, re- one reason for that is that uh, when, you know, something's boiling really hard and you pour uh, dried malt extract into it, it can really, you know, foam up. Oh. Uh, you know, not that that's... You can get around that by just sort of not pouring the whole, you know, load of, of malt extract in at one time. But uh, we just for, you know, just for convenience, we put uh, liquid malt extract for the uh, early ones. And, and stuff you add, uh, dry max extract that you add before the boil starts, uh, we usually just go with dried for mm-hmm. that. But, you know, malt extract, if it's fresh and in good quality, e- either form will work. Good to know. Uh, and you can also, you don't, ha- as you said, you don't have to add it all at once. You can kind of dribble it in a little at, at the time and, and not have to knock the boil down. Uh, as they were talking in the in the troubleshooting panel um, that I moderated out at uh, uh, Oakland, uh, I think that that was one suggestion that uh, maybe Tommy and uh, Tommy Arthur and Vinnie Gilerzo were talking about. You know, instead of just whack. You know, adding all your fermentables, boom, you know, at once and knocking your boil down and having to come back up. You know, you can just kind of dribble over time and and uh, keep your boil going at the at the same time. Uh, the next recipe is barbecue brow with the little umlauts and things and you know <laughs> in the uh, in the German tradition, I guess, of uh, of barbecued beers. In the German meat spinal tap tradition, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just random umlauts. <laughs> what? Uh, tell us about that one. This is just a beer that I've brewed, um, you know, as an all grain beer many, many times. Uh, it was originally inspired by uh, Schlenkerler Rauch beer, which is which is a classic uh, Rauch beer. It's it's a um, you know, it's essentially like you might want to think of a a Vienna Lager or, or Oktoberfest that's uh, smoked beer. You know, they're or at least their their main product from or most famous product from Schlenkerle is a smoked Marzen. And I started brewing um, smoked beers before I had the uh, ability to to lager properly, and so I used to just make it sort of as a German alt instead. Hmm. Um, use use smoke malt, just use a nice neutral uh, ale yeast. Low hopping rate, no no late hops, and uh, it, you know it just makes a nice smoky beer that that's great on its own, but but really um, just goes spectacularly well with with barbecue. And th- this is another one you, you you would be hard pressed to find a smoked malt extract. Uh, <laughs> probably not probably not any out there. Uh, so if you if you wanted to to do an extract beer and you and you wanted to have a smoked beer, doing a partial mash is is uh, one way to do it. I don't know if it's the only way. I was going to say the only way to do it, but surely somebody out there has done it in another way. Yeah, there's. I mean, actually, I think Weyermann may make a smoked malt extract at least as a seasonal. Huh. Um, but oh, I mean, no. I've never I, I've never seen it in in the states at a, at a homebrew shop. But I mean, I don't have a kaleidoscopic knowledge of what every homebrew shop stocks. <laughs> um, but, yeah, as, a, as an extract brewer, you'd be sort of hard-pressed to make a smoked beer like this because you, um, you know, in the absence of finding smoked malt extract, you, you couldn't really steep enough of the, the smoked malt to get a good, you know, uh, good amount of that smoky flavor in there. You would, you know, unless you're hauling, you know, four or five pounds of, uh, you know, grain in, in your steeping bag, which is which is a lot more than most people would ever attempt, um, you know, you just wouldn't get that. So this recipe, it has, you know, four pounds of the uh, 
of the Rauch malts, which is a, which is a smoked uh, malt. It's you know it's a little darker than a than a Pilsner malt. Yeah, at that rate, you'll get a nice amount of smokiness in the beer. It'll be um, it won't be over the top like some some smoked beers are, are just you know incredibly strong uh, smokiness, and others are are subtle almost to the point that you don't taste the smoke at at four pounds per five gallons. You you'll definitely taste it, but it won't be overwhelming. Hmm. And you know other other approaches that uh, an extract brewer could use to make a smoked beer would be use peat smoked malt, which you can use in very small quantities, but that has a more sort of uh, it's it's a harsher, more acrid kind of smokiness. Um, I mean, it's certainly at the right levels, it, it can be very nice in certain styles of beer, but in a beer where the, where there's going to be a, a pronounced smokiness, I, I think the Rauch malts uh, does a lot. Well, there's uh, we actually have four recipes. We've got <laughs> we've got the uh, uh, Bass Dropper Vice, a sour mash oh, yeah. beer, hiding in there. Uh, and we've talked about um, <clears throat> we've talked about sour mash uh, beers before as well. Uh, so you can also do that. You don't have to do all a full all grain uh, batch to do a sour mash beer. Yeah, that's a, uh, that's another nice thing about partial mashing is that, like, you know, as an extract brewer, you can't really, you know, there, there's no way to, to to do a sour mash because, you know, obviously you need to mash. And uh, the the best trooper vice is just a is just an easy way to do a quick uh, sour mash. You can run it the sour mash one or two days, then you just run off. Um, and using the cooler, you can do this. You just run off basically all but the top layer of wort because if the uh from the from the grain bed because if you do have any contamination that's going to uh cause flavor problems it's most likely floating right on top uh where where it has ac- access to air i uh, like specifically you know vinegar vinegary flavored uh off things are going to come from acetobacter which uh isn't going to be living down in the the middle of a mash uh, you know of a sour mash it'll be living on top so you just drain off like most of the uh most of the mash from the, or I'm sorry, most of the wort from the grain bed, and it, it's sour, and then you do you know you boil it and you proceed to make a beer like you normally would, uh, but it turns out you know nice and sour, and because you're not in this in this beer you're not souring it by uh, you know adding bacteria to your fermenter, uh, you know it's it's not something that's going to take forever to develop. It's also not something that then you have to freak out that your equipment you used it for a sour beer because mm-hmm. you you know you boiled the wort uh, prior to that and it you know it develops in, in the the amount of time that that a normal ale would be you know I mean it doesn't it, it's modeled after a Berliner Weiss but it doesn't get as uh, it doesn't get as dry and as as puckeringly sour as a Berliner Weiss it it, um, it stays it's less sour and it's got a nice little sweet sour balance to it. Hmm. Uh, but it's very doable, uh, very interesting, and the only really trick you need to know is is when you're when you're done and you've got you know four uh, four pounds worth of sour malt in your uh, in your cooler is just fill the cooler with hot water and put like a teaspoon of uh, uh, baking soda in it and let it sit overnight and that'll take all the 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 odd smells and the sourness out of it. Oh, cool! So run quickly how you would use your uh, countertop uh, partial uh, mash container uh, to make a, a sour mash. Well, first of all, you just you just start off with a plain mash. You take about you know roughly three quarters uh, of the uh, the grains that you would mash, mash them in at at you know well pretty much whatever mash temperature you want. I think I picked in the low one fifties. Um, let that mash so that the uh, you know the starches get degraded into sugar. Then while that's going, take the remaining amount of your malt and sort of stir that uh, into room temperature water. And then when the when the mash is done, stir that, uh, you know, the, the room temperature mix into this, the sour mash to bring it down to right about 120. That's uh, that's sort of the upper level of where the, the souring uh, um, organisms will live, but it's higher than a lot of the other stuff will live comfortably at. So you sort of select for the... Uh, Select for the you know sour bugs, and there'll be you know um, there'll be bacteria just living on the grain, 
uh, you know, from when, when they're growing out in the field, there's, you know, those bacteria live on the grain. And then when they're uh, malted, you know, then they sit and steep in, in water and the temperatures like that, they're, they're, you know, they get deposited on the, uh, on the malted barley. So they're there. And also in, in the recipe, I, I, I call for adding, um, you know, add a tube of Y yeast or, or white labs bacteria just to, you know, to make sure that you get, get enough in there to get the, the souring to go quickly and nicely. And, uh, basically the one trick with that is, is I like to, if I'm going to use bacteria in a sour mash is make sure to acclimate your bacteria. I'll just either just stick the, the white labs tube, just push it down into the mash. So it's just sitting on top, you know, uh, or just lay the white, white yeast bag on top of the mash for like, you know, 20 minutes or whatever until it heats up and then, you know, open them up and pour them in and, and stir in the, uh, the bacteria. Hmm. Cause if you just, you know, if you pull the, the, the bacteria out of the fridge and it's at 40 degrees and then you dump it into a 120 degree, uh, mash right away, you know, you've just pretty much wasted buying those mm. <laughs> bacteria cause mm. they're not gonna, there's not gonna be a high survival rate for that. And then how long does it take to sour nicely? You know, one to two days is really all you need. And also the, the longer you go, the more problems you're going to get with, with the potential for off flavors to develop. So, mm. Um, it, you know, if you, if you do this beer as a summer beer, which is, which is good and you can set your, your cooler outside somewhere where it's warm and keep it relatively insulated, um, a day is probably really enough to get, you know, a decent amount of sourness so that your beer is sort of recognizably sour, you know, so when you taste it, you don't, it doesn't seem like, you know, has this beer gone bad? You know, you'll know definitely that it was meant to be sour, not just <laughs> nasty. Not, yeah, n- yeah, not just a pale ale that that wasn't brewed well. Um, yeah, and I, uh, you know, if you like a little bit, little bit extra more sour crunch, let it go for two days, and uh, you know, beyond that, if you want to push your luck and and try it for longer, uh, you know, especially if you can keep the temperature up, give it a try. But I really think. Most of the time, just being able to keep, you know, the temperature in, in most cases is going to drop significantly because you've got a smaller cooler. And even if you keep it outside, um, you know, it's going to get somewhat cooler at night or whatever. And you're not going to be able to control the temperature quite as well as you would like. And so, you know, a day or two days should do should do it in most cases. And with, you know, inoculated with, with uh, lab-grown bacteria, you'll get a good, strong uh, start. You know, as, as strong as as strong as bacteria are going to go, they don't. They, they're never going to take off like uh, brewer's yeast is in a, in a sugary solution. But they'll get it. They'll get a good uh, good head start on that work. I was up in my attic uh, a couple of weeks ago when it was you know near a hundred degrees outside, and I know it was. I don't know. It had to be at least ten degrees hotter up there. Maybe twenty. I don't know. I was thinking, hey, this would be a nice place to stick a, a mash while it's soured. I'll have to remember that, would, that next year. That would be an excellent place for a sour mash. The last recipe is the 1850 Compromise Bock. What's up with that? This is just a, a recipe for an American-style Bock or a, or a Texas-style Bock modeled on uh, what I know of Shiner Bock. Um, the name just comes from uh, back in 1850. Uh, Texas was, uh, or immediately prior to that, was was a much larger region, and um, there was some compromise with the, in the in the government, and it shrunk Texas to its current size, and that was called the 1850 Compromise. And likewise, you know, the technique we're using here, partial mashing, is a compromise between uh, extract and all grain, and also a lot of people view, you know. Uh, American style box or Texas style box as as a compromise between you know quote unquote real box and, and American beers. So uh, that was a, the overly long and, and and boring genesis of the name of that beer. <laughs> but the but the technique that uh, you bring in on this one is uh, a cereal mash. Right, cereal mash is a very useful technique for any all grain brewer to know, and certainly something that. Uh, as this recipe shows, any uh, partial mash brewer can uh, can learn, and it basically allows you to use any starchy adjunct. 
and really what you do in this one, um, you use either corn grits or rice uh, as the adjunct, and you just you know uh, dilute those with water uh, to you know fairly thick uh, porridge-like consistency. You throw in you know basically a handful of uh, crushed malt along with that, and you just slowly heat it and stir it to boiling. Um, as an option, if you want, you can stop at like you know somewhere between 158 and 162 for about five minutes, and just they'll let some of the some of the starch from the uh, the grains will get degraded right then by the, the small amount of uh, of uh, barley you've added um, or small amount of malt you've added, uh, and that just helps it be a little bit less viscous when you add it to the the I main malt. But basically, you you know, you heat up your uh, your cereal mash, you know, the adjunct and the, and the small amount of grain, uh, boil it for about 15 minutes, or, you know, it, the amount doesn't really matter once you get past, you know, 10 minutes or so, but 15 or 20 minutes, and then you have your main mash mashed in at a slightly lower temperature, and what you do, then when you add the, uh, when you add the hot adjunct mash, or the cereal mash, to the main mash, stir it in, it comes up to, you know, the, the sacrif- sacrification temperatures, you know, the, the temperatures where the enzymes quickly turn uh, starch into, into the sugars you need. And that's basically it. And you can do it with, you know, it, it's used in corn and rice and American lagers all the time. But basically any 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 starchy vegetable that, that you can find uh, or grain that you can find, you can do a cereal mash with and incorporate that. Uh, you know that source of carbohydrates into your beer. Now, what what do they require a cereal mash? What's going on in there? Well, they're not malted. Is the thing you? Uh, I, I don't know if if you could malt rice or corn. Uh, if you know, I, I don't know if, if there's some technical reason why you can't, or if it's just not feasible. But but nobody malts uh, corn or rice. So in order to uh, have them work in the mash, you need to get uh, you need to have the, the starch in, in those adjuncts uh, readily available for the uh, enzymes in the malt to degrade. So the basic idea of boiling it is just you, you know, starch in, inside plants comes in little granules, and, you know, this is true in both the barley and in any any plant that stores starch, uh, it just comes in little granules, and heat eventually ruptures them, and, um, you know, and a sufficient amount of heat is also required to just make the... Uh, the starch, you know, from solid into into sort of a gel, and so that that's what the uh, the boiling stage does. It just ruptures the starch granules and and makes them, you know, go from, uh, you know, sort of a compact uh, solid structure that the the enzymes couldn't get at to one that's, uh, you know, a gel that that the enzymes can penetrate. So something similar to what's going on with the sweet potatoes that we first talked about. Very similar, yeah. The, the the big difference there is that um, actually they are pretty much the same. <laughs> the, the big difference is there is that there's no real difference. <laughs> One's a potato, and one is corn. Yeah the uh, <laughs> the the starch gelation temperature of potatoes is a lot lower, um, but given that they're uh, you know given that you boil those and, and the the corn or rice and the other you know it. It really doesn't matter what the what that temperature is exactly because you you know you're way over that temperature in the uh, in the boil and then you're you're still over that temperature you know by a good degree in the in the mashing of the potatoes and um, I think you're still over it actually in in a mash with corn and rice but just not by as much of a much of a margin. And if you don't want to do a cereal mash and you want to use corn, you can use flaked corn or flaked maize, right? Yeah, flaked maize has been uh, – it's, it's maize that's been run through like a mill. So it's very, very thin and, and basically will dissolve in, in the uh, – uh, it's also the, – the mill, I believe, is heated so that the starch crystals rupture and that's ready to go. You can also just use – there are versions of corn syrup that are – made specifically for brewers, uh, called, cleverly enough, brewers-grade corn syrup. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to use corn that way, that's also possible. There's also rice syrup, uh, and there's uh, there's also rice flakes. 
so yeah, there's there's a number of different ways that you can use it, but um, using it, you know, starting from actual rice or starting from corn grits is, you know, you're starting with a little more basic, unprocessed ingredient, and some people um, I know are just going to want to try, you know, a more, uh, a, you know, a brew made from from less processed ingredients rather than more processed ingredients. Sure. It's just fun to try, I think. Yeah, more more stuff to do. And that's, that's why we're in the hobby is we like to do stuff. <laughs> and uh, and if and if it makes good beer, well, so much the better. Well, thanks, Chris. This is the I'm, I might try some of these recipes, these are, especially the uh, uh, the sour mash. I'm, I've been interested in, in trying that because I like sour beers, but uh, you know I don't like to wait, so <laughs> I am lazy in that way. Or impatient, yeah, making, I guess. More impatient than lazy. Making sour mashes is fun. It's uh, and and it's just something that I don't know. You know, I think any brewer who you know has has been brewing for a while should give one a try. You know, sometime just because they're gonna they're gonna likely have fun with it. And you know, um, you always anytime you're doing it with a sour mash, you're risking that you're risking a few little off flavors. It, it's you know, it's not foolproof by any stretch of the imagination. But if you you know, if you do it smart, you know, particularly if you add some supplemental bacteria, um, you know, and don't don't try to have the the sour mash run completely off of just you know the bacteria on the grain, uh, your your probability of success goes way up. Awesome. Well, all right, Chris, I appreciate your time again. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Well, thanks again to Chris. You can find those four recipes. In the upcoming issue of Brew Your Own Magazine, if you want a free copy, you can click on the BYO banner ad on basicbrewing.com. If you choose to subscribe after reading that issue, you'll be helping to support this podcast. We greatly appreciate your support. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our homebrewing DVDs, Introduction to Extract Homebrewing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find those at basicbrewingshop.com. We've got combo deals there to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. You can also see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. We also have shirts there and some hats, too, as well. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Magical Mushrooms, Mischievous Molds, and Zuzu Pets, Hamster, Pipsqueak, Yellow, I don't know what that means. But there it is. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping, and we appreciate your support. People buying some nice stuff this time. Digital cameras and stuff. Really nice. Don't forget that you can also uh, join the American Home Brewers Association through an associate link on basicbrewing.com. And don't forget the BYO associate link as well. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio. And our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dotson down in Austin. Hope to see you in Portland. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.